Let's go, folks. Time for the Gibby Show. How you doing, baseball fans? Welcome to another edition of the Gibby Show presented by Miller Lite, the official beer of Major League Baseball and the Gibby Show. I'm John Arezzi, and joining me direct from San Antonio, Texas, the former member of the 86 world champion New York Mets, two-time manager of the Toronto Blue Jays, author, the man who always tells it like it is, enjoying life in San Antonio, Mr. John Gibbons. John, how you doing? Johnny, I'm doing good, pal. It's good, good to see you. You know, you have a good uh, week out there having fun. Well, yeah, yeah. It, you know, it, it's, it's, I guess I'd call myself semi-retired. I guess semi-retirement ain't, ain't too ain't too bad. You know, uh, uh, but you know what? I'm still following that baseball, and, and uh, yeah. Blue Jays are on a nice little roll. Um, they certainly are. They certainly are. We're going to discuss the Red Hot Jays in spite of that home stand finale. Uh, we have a great gabbing with Gibby today, brought to you by Tim Hortons. We'll have another roast and toast inspired by our friends at Miller Lite. But lots to go over today, John. So let's go right to the leadoff. I mean, the uh, the Jays finished off 5-1 and one on this homestand. It's an incredible road, uh, homestand if you take a look at it. I mean, I felt great uh, when Varsho got that, uh, that walk-off. I mean, the starting pitching was incredible. Uh, and here's one stat that I want to bring up to you. When you go through the starting uh, five of the Jays, incredible numbers. The last two turns of the rotation, Kevin Gossman, 0.0 ERA. Kikuchi, 0.77 ERA. Man. Marios, 1.29 ERA. Manoa, 1.50 ERA, and Bassett even had a 1.42 before uh, Sunday's game. But, I mean, can you ask for any better than that from your starting five? It's crazy. I mean, how do you ever lose a game? Well, actually, they almost didn't, right? (laughs) Yeah, you know what, John? I think – I mean, that's an incredible role, but they're very talented, right? You know, going into the season, you know, uh, the the top three – uh, they were locked in. You know what? They no probably no concerns at all. You know, and they just brought in Bassett as a free agent. You know, they they were worried. You know, about Kikuchi and Barrios uh, of their struggles last year. And they early on they got into a little bit of struggles, but you know they've ironed it out. Pete Walker's got to them. They they figure something out. You know, and, and um, so to, to get on those rolls like that, I mean that that's incredible. You, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna be a good team. You're gonna win your fair share of games and. What these what's this pitching staff needs to just remember is listen, we got a dynamite offense, man. You know, I don't have to shut everybody down every night. I don't have to I get a guy on third base. I, you know, uh there's sometimes I can give up a scratch run, trade a run for an out, right? I don't have to strike this guy out. Because I know my offense is gonna be good. It's it, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna score the four, five, six, whatever runs a game. So just just keep the game in check, pitch smart. Yeah. And we'll win a lot of games, and that's that's what they're doing because they're very, very balanced and well rounded. Yeah, and those high leverage relievers. I mean, Jordan Romano. I mean, can this guy get any better? I mean, it was just it's incredible. Swanson is doing great. Uh, they had some trouble with uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the bullpen, but you can't use Romano every single game. I mean, he's been used a lot, but he's done phenomenally well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're, they're they're solid down there, you know. I mean, but there's going to be uh, people. What people have to remember is is uh, you know, depending on how far your starter goes, right? And especially in this analytics world, where they they cut these guys off a lot of times too early, in my opinion. But that's just that's the way the game is. So be it. But so if you're only going to get five innings, let's say, out of your starter, even six, you know, that's that's three or four extra innings you got to cover. To get through the end of a nine inning game, right? And, 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 and relievers only basically go one inning a piece anymore as it is. So somewhere along the line, if you've got to cover three, four, possibly five innings, there could be a hiccup along the way, right? You can't, you can't expect them all to be stellar if the game's somewhat close. So, but their bullpen's good. Their starting rotations is good. Um, they've the answered offense. some. Yeah, and yeah, that's that's their that's their bread and butter right now. And so just yeah. just keep the game close and let those boys in the with the bats take over. Yeah, huge uh, huge turnout at the Rogers Center. The fans flocking to the stadium. I mean, drawing uh, over one hundred twenty thousand. 
uh, for the weekend series. Um, I mean, the fans left a little disappointed. I mean, but you could look at that last game of the homestand, John, and and you look at the intensity of a guy like Chris Bassett. All right, very intense. And he was like that on the Mets, as I mentioned before on the show. I mean, he would get together with Scherzer, and these guys were so intense. None of the guys wanted to even be anywhere around them. Uh, and Bassett lost it uh, uh, temper-wise uh, on uh, Sunday's game. He was getting squeezed a little bit by the home plate umpire. Uh, a couple of pitches called a different way. Maybe four runs don't score. He gets back to the dugout, and he goes nuts. He's pacing. He's throwing things around, and then he takes the tablet. I guess he was looking at the pitches he threw in that in that inning uh, that he didn't get called strikes on, and he just busts that th- th- thing. And I'm looking. No one is going near him. Now, as a skipper, what would you do in a situation like that? I mean, what's what's your take on when somebody blows up like that who's in the starting starting pitcher, but uh, he, he knew he got squeezed? What would you do in that situation? Uh, nothing different than uh, Schneid did, you know. Uh yeah, you gotta you gotta let these guys vent sometimes and in in, uh, in in react however, however however they might. You know, everybody will clear out, give them give them their space. Now, where you run into trouble is if a guy's gonna hurt himself. You see these knuckleheads sometimes hit the walls or things like that. Um, and and also it depends on what's you got to know what this like 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 Bassett. I'm sure his is just he's such a perfectionist. It's a, maybe it's pitch selection he made, or maybe he was getting squeezed, whatever it might have been, right? Legitimate arguments, right? Now, if a guy's whining, you know he's wrong in it, what he's what he's complaining about. Uh, you know, if the umpire didn't squeeze you, or this guy's just a chronic complainer, right? Never uh, excuse maker. That's a little different. Sometimes you got to say, "Hey, knock it off, man. You get the hell out of the dugout and beat your head against the wall underneath." But it, I mean, so it, it all depends on what you're dealing with. Um, and you got to remember too, with starting pitchers. When they get frustrated, you know they they only they only pitch once every five days. You know that's a long time in between. So if they don't if they're not feeling good on that one particular day, that's a long wait for them. So uh, it's not like an everyday player. You know he's he's right back out there uh, with later in the game or the very next day. So uh, yeah, it eats but, at you I mean, probably if you have to wait four days. Who's emotions that guy? is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, of course it is. I mean, it's an emotional game, and you got to have that intensity. You just don't want right. to be out there and just like be lethargic or not give a crap. Uh, right. But who was that guy when you were uh, managing? That was that one guy that you let go because he was just out of out of control sometimes, anger wise. You know what? It uh, all of them. You know, I mean, they have a right to. You know, they get paid a lot of money, and they're they're under under pressure. Um, and you just gotta, you just gotta let them do what they want every now. Because you know, a manager gets frust- just as frustrated. We, you know, we throw yeah. things, we go out, we can, we can vent, go out in the field and argue, and what what have you. And that's just part of it, you know. Uh, I'd rather have that than somebody just sits there and takes it and, and, and the, is making a lot of money, and they just kind of go, well, whatever, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the only thing is, you don't want it to become detrimental to the team, or they, the guy may do something stupid and hurt himself and can't pitch for a while or whatever it is. Sometimes you got to try. I've said this before. Sometimes you just got to turn your back, man. Yeah, I mean, in that case, uh, yesterday, uh, well, actually over the weekend, it did happen that way. Um, uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, Jays. Uh, they're going to be on the road now to May 12th. They had a great homestand. They're doing well. But now they go and take on the Boston Red Sox, and they go to play the team with the second best record in the majors right now, the surprising Pittsburgh Pirates, finishing up uh, – with the Phillies. Now that's a long trip. Uh, lots of travel, lots of competitive baseball upcoming for the Jays. Um, so what's your take on what they have coming up? And then I have a question for you, uh, that, uh, uh, has been on my mind. You okay. Hey, the only thing easy about this trip is the, the travel distance, right? It's this, the cities are all close by. That's uh, to He's Toronto. Close. Yeah, you know what? But, you know, the big leagues is tough. You know, there's really, um, you know, beginning of the season with Tampa got off to that great start. We looked at their schedule, and, and there's no doubt that, I mean, they, they had that in their favor. But that'll catch up with them. They'll, they'll run the gauntlet sooner or later as well. So the big leagues uh, is, is is tough. And that's why the teams that win it in the end, you tip your hat to because they, you know, it's it's quite an achievement. But 
you know, they go to Boston. Boston's kind of mixed right now. I mean, they're above 500, you know, in the American League East, but they're, they're not the old Red Sox, you know. It'd, it'd be interesting because uh, Toronto handled them uh, last year. I mean, it wasn't even, it wasn't even close, the uh, series record or the season record. Um, so, I and they, you know what? Toronto, they don't mind playing in Fenway. You know, they it, it's, it can be kind of a, a tough crowd sometimes, not not to these guys. Then moving on to Pittsburgh, it's more of a surprise, I think, to everybody in the game. But you got to tip your hat to them. But th- they'll come back down to earth too. I don't think they're quite there yet. But may- mm-hmm. maybe not. Should you know, we're going to talk a little bit later about uh, uh, strength of division and things like that. But um, th- that plays a factor too. But it'll be a good gauge. I think it'll it'll help the baseball. We'll figure out Pittsburgh a little bit more and it kind of give the Blue Jays a little better, better idea. And then, of course, Phillies. Phillies started to put it together again. Mm-hmm. Had a good series down there in Houston over the weekend. So uh, it's definitely not an easy trip, but this is no. a big leagues. Yeah, that's true. Um, when it comes to the team and how it's performed, um, looking at it, uh, big picture, what's keeping you up at night, if anything, with the Toronto Blue Jays right now on the makeup of this team and where they're going? Other than my wife snoring, nothing. <laughs> let me t- let me tell you, John. If we got uh, what's the record now? Whatever it is, it's like uh, I, I saw something the other day. It's like one of the in, in Blue Jays history. It's like one of the top three records they've ever had. We were dying for those, man, when I was around there. So uh, yeah, I don't think there's anything other than you know you you know when you when you quoted the uh, how the starting pitches pitching is done you know that's not going to last there's going to be some bumps along the way you know that's that's part of it i don't care how good you are so you just try to ride that the wave as long as you can you know i think that everybody's getting playing time so you don't worry about that and um you know varsho had that big hit he'd been scuffing a little bit so i don't really think there's anything to worry about if you want to know the truth or you know um uh what the heck you know it's, it's a good, good place to be yeah plus now i'm on the outside looking in man i i, I don't worry about much now well, you're enjoying the game, and uh, speaking of it, you you are listening to the Gibby Show presented by Miller Light. John uh, had a question for you in regard to it's a big week. It's Cinco de Mayo week. Are you going to uh, partake in any Miller Lights for Cinco oh, de Mayo? Yeah, you know what? I'll be having a couple of Miller Lights and barbecuing in my backyard. That's big down here, man. I'm in South Texas. I'm I'm close to that border. In a, a, a large Mexican population in San Antonio, you know. So, That's right. Uh, so I'm going to actually, for the people who are watching on YouTube, John. Yes. I am uh, wearing, uh, I guess this was one of your favorite luchadors back in the day, Mr. Mil Moscaris. Yeah, it's old Mil. Oh, yeah, I loved him, man. I used to watch him every Saturday night. I'd come home from a date and sit down on the TV and watch watch wrestling on TV. Big Mil. Was and great. I great. Yeah, you know what? Plus, uh, we used to go. My family used to go across the border every summer back when you could. You know, in uh, in my mom, I, we found a, a mill, a, one of his masks, and uh, you know they were. My, you could barter. You'd barter with the street vendors and everything. And so they, my parents bought me one of those masks, and I was wearing it across the the bridge, whatever that bridge that connects the the two countries. You know, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's funny. That was my guy, man. It was, yeah. I heard you talk about Mil Moscaris before. But, uh, yeah, Cinco de Mayo this week. We'll be enjoying our Miller Lights. It's always uh, – there's always time for Miller Light. I mean, always. So uh, enjoy Cinco de Mayo <laughs> with our friends over at Miller Light. Definitely. It tastes like Miller time. Corner booths. Sticky floors. Weekdays that feel like weekends. You never forget the way some things taste. Miller Lite. Great taste, 90 calories. Tastes like Miller time. Well, John, speaking about uh, Mexico, uh, there is a wild two-game series down in Mexico City. Uh, The uh, Western rivals, San Francisco Giants and San San Diego Padres, played two games. They were crazy wild games. Padres winning both of them, 16-11 and also 6-4. Uh, it was the first time ever that major league games were played in Mexico City. So uh, one thing that happened there that really made a lot of news, and we're getting back to Lucha Libre and Luchadors, Rey Mysterio uh, is a Hall of Fame Luchador in the WWE. And he went uh, to the game. He was a big Padres fan. And he gave out masks 
uh, to all the players, which really went over big uh, down there in Mexico. And uh, uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, Manny Machado, uh, Fernando Tatis, they were wearing the Rey Mysterio mask. There were tons of pictures taken. It got a ton of national publicity. But uh, uh, discussing these ventures that Major League Baseball is going into, they're going to London later this year, uh, these uh, these uh, international series. Uh, what's your take on that stuff, uh, you know, and especially going to a country like Mexico, which uh, loves baseball so much? <laughs> Choke me up with that, Johnny. No, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously it was a big hit down there. You know, it was, it was a – it's a different kind of game because with the elevation, they were telling me how many thousand more feet that it, it is than even Colorado, right? Where a lot the Rockies of home play. Runs yeah, so you just get a ball airborne, you know. I don't, you know, uh, but but the the Mexican culture loves baseball. There's no doubt about it. There's been so many good players that come over from him from you know Mexico to play in the states here. Um, so yeah, it, it was a big success like that. I mean, we when I first started out with the Blue Jays, we made the trip. They when the Expos start, were playing some games down in Puerto Rico, and I and I enjoyed that going down there, you know. But that's a Caribbean island too, man. I'm, the morning I was out there laying on the beach, you know. Uh, so yeah, it's been a hit for baseball. I know they're trying to expand the uh, uh, the fan bases, you know, all over the world. They're doing a pretty good job of it, you know. Um, yeah, let, yeah. The, the, the only complaint anybody ever has of that is the travel to it, right? Like if you got to go overseas, you know. Even, even I think I think San Diego went from Chicago. The Mexico City, which is a decent, pretty good hike. If you go over there to London, I know they've done that before. It's like um, that's that's a pretty good ways to go. But other than that, they seem to enjoy it because they they roll out the red carpet for these guys. They do, and it's good for the countries that it goes to, and it expands uh, baseball internationally, which is the goal of Major League Baseball. Well, John, that's the uh, lead off for you, and now it's time for gabbing with Gibby, brought to you by Tim Hortons this week. From May 1st to May 7th, every small cookie purchased at your local Tim's supports your community. 100% of small cookie proceeds go to over 600 charities and community groups in over 900 neighborhoods in Canada. It's deliciously easy to make a difference with the small cookie. Oh yeah, it's 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 a it's a great thing they're doing. Uh, you know, Tim Hortons one of the best. There's no doubt about it, but. Anytime you can help the needy out there, they go do it. Plus, if, uh, if you love pastries and cookies like I do, what the heck? It's a no-brainer, man. Go help somebody out and, you know what, fill your own boiler. Yeah, enjoy the Tims and then also help the community with the smile cookie. On this week's Gabbing with Gibby, we have a good one. We are happy to bring on former Major League Baseball umpire who worked in the majors for 43 seasons with the all-time record of 5,460 games. He ejected a total of 151 major leaguers from games during his storied career and outside of the diamond sang on the grand all Opry and umpired in the first ever world series game in Canada in 1992. We're happy to bring on Joe West. Joe, welcome to Gabbing with Gibby. <laughs> well, it's good to be here. This this will be a lot of fun, but I got to correct you on a couple of things here. Oh, all right. There we go. I didn't, have okay. a, I didn't have 150 ejections. I had 196. 196. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's, a, that's more they, impressive. They must have missed a season or two there. <laughs> Hey, that was hey, you. You were in the game so long. That was probably at the beginning when they didn't keep track of things. Man. <laughs> they might have not had the numbers. Yeah, they might have not tracked it. <laughs> you know, that's it. That sounds like a lot, but that was only about four a season. So uh, I never, I never forget. Uh, I was playing golf with the uh, Rick Russell and his wife and my wife, and we were over in Lakeland. And she came in the the clubhouse after it was over. Said, "You got, you guys just got married, and that's going to calm you down." You're not going to have any more ejections. You're just going to be the nicest umpire on the field because of your wife, Rita. <laughs> so we left there. When I go to Chicago, I kicked out five guys in a beat ball. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you're taking your frustrations at home out of the field. That's what it was all about. <laughs> That's what I used to do. Hey, Joe, listen, it's, it's, a, it's a real privilege and an honor uh, – I got to tell you, you're one of my favorite guys. You know, I, I ended up managing for 10 years, but I always look forward to when you you were on the crew. And, and I got to tell you this, 
I thought you always had the best, your be, the best umpire behind home plate. Balls and strike. I've never seen some, anybody so consistent, right? And you know what? And, and even more importantly, the the games that you umpired never got out of control, right? You know, got you know that, you know, and I've been involved with some other crews, and things start going haywire, and you know, it's like chaos. You were always in charge, and you know what? There was never doubt in my mind or any of the players' mind. They would bark at you, but they all they they knew who the boss was, and that thing, I think that's important in, in uh, umpiring. I, I don't think everybody has that now, though. Well, you know, there's another thing that you you forget. Uh, I umpired 22 years in the National League before I got to work American League games, and so I had a little reputation when they switched the crews to work in both leagues, and. Uh, it was, I, I can remember the guys I worked with. I mean, one crew I was on, I was with Doug Harvey, Frank Pulley, Jerry Crawford, and myself. Oh. Well, I was like the choir boy of that crew. <laughs> 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 and, and, I mean, I was I was there when they gave Harvey the nickname God. You know, I was, I was in Wrigley Field, and all of a sudden he ran across the field and he Threw his hands up, was yelling at the ground crew, put the tarp on. Now, it looked like it was going to rain, but it hadn't rained a drop yet. Sure enough, before they can get the tarp on the field, it's pouring. I mean, it's a deluge. So Dick Williams is in the other dugout, and he said, that's it. He's God from now on. <laughs> so about, about a month later, we go to New York, and they got the Padres and, and the Mets. And Dwight Gooden's pitching for the Mets, and I forget who was pitching for the Padres, but in the first inning, it, it's raining. But if we don't start the game, we can't get it in. So in the first inning, they hit a ground ball to Garvey at first base. He waved the pitcher off and slipped and fell down. So that's the first error Garvey had made in like 15 years. <laughs> mainly, uh, because, mainly because he didn't throw the ball anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> I always heard that. So anyway, uh, now we play a couple of days. The Mets got a couple runs, and sure enough, uh, by the third inning, it's raining so hard we can't see each other. And Doug calls time out, you know. And everybody's rushing to get the tarp on the field as I'm coming off the field. Like I said, I was working with Harvey, Pulley, and Crawford. Well, nobody in either dugout was going to yell at those three guys. So I was like, like I said, the choir board. So Steve Garvey is standing on the top step of the dugout. And he stops me coming off the field. He's getting soaked. Everybody else is sitting up under the dugout. And he said, did any of y'all check the field before the game? So I said, yeah, Doug checked it. And about that time, Terry Kennedy said, yeah, but that son of a bitch can walk on water. How does he expect us to play in this shit? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got a quick uh, Doug Harvey joke or uh, story for you. Because, you know, I, I played very little in the big leagues, right? But I, I well, caught, you, you know, played, maybe, played, maybe. You played two years. Yeah. You, so what years. Years. you had 50 so I, at max. Fifty, damn, dude, you checking me out? Yeah, <laughs> that one year you hit hit like you know four hundred. You played. Oh yeah, the eighty six match uh, world champions. I was a leading hitter on that ball club. Don't yeah. you forget it? Yeah, they, they, they they won the World Series and they and they fired you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Joe, I, Doug Harvey's behind the plate, right? He's up part. I'm and I'm catching, you know, and, and I didn't play much. So I'm, I'm I'm crapping in my pants, you know. I'm just trying to I'm trying to do everything right. So there's there's like two outs, and he says to me, he's leaning over. He goes, hey, he said, son, he goes, uh, how many outs are there? And I said, I'm, I had to think. <laughs> I'm like, no, there's there's two outs, and he goes, no, I think there's only one. You know, okay, whatever. So I don't remember who was pitching, but they struck the guy out. So I come up, throw it. The third base, you know, Ray Knight and those guys are running off the field, and I throw into left field, and he's back here laughing, man. He said, "The sucker set me up." I said, "You got to be shit. I'm, I'm, I'm crapping in my pants." And and he's, he's, he, uh, and I fell for his, uh, I fell for his joke. So, but yeah, he was, uh, you know, the guy. He, yeah, there's, there's a group of legends, man. You're one of them, Doug Harvey. They called God, Bruce Fremy, and There's, uh, there's not many of you. But let me ask you a question. To do it forty years, I mean, are you, are you trying to were you trying to punish yourself, man? Why would anybody want to do that for forty years? Well, you forget that after my twenty second year, they fired me in that union deal. So a lot of those guys just took their severance money and went home. You know, we Drew Coble was in the American League. He 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 okay. took the money, and went home. Terry Tata took the money, and went home. Frank Pulley took the money and went home. 
And uh, they said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I gave them 22 of the work, the best years of my life. Now I'm going to give them 20 of the worst. <laughs> but anyway, and the funny thing about it was I had no idea about this record until about a year before it happened. And, um, and that was, uh, that was just another thing to keep you going. I had, I had knee replacement before my last season. And in five, in five weeks after the knee replacement, I was playing golf. But, uh, and that was, you know, that was an interesting time because everywhere you went, everybody was going, Hey, go get them. You know, I had, I had a couple of owners go, tell me, don't quit till you get the record. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's a cra- you know, that's the Cal Ripken record, right? Of, uh, of umpire that'll mm-hmm. never be broken. I mean, it, it just won't happen. I mean, it, it's, I, you know, you know what? I don't think people appreciate enough either. Joe is, is, is how tough a life it is on an umpire with all the traveling, you know, the teams, you know, they get, you know, they get the, they hop on the charters after the here and there. You guys are always on the move. Do you even get, you even get home much at all during, during the season? It's just constant. Well, when, when I started in the late seventies, uh, there was no time off. And then we had a strike in 79. Well, actually it wasn't a strike. It was a informational picket. That's what the technical term was. <laughs> and they, uh, no, that's what it was because, we couldn't strike, but we didn't have contracts. We all signed individual contracts, so we just didn't sign them. So they hired eight guys to replace, uh, what was it, some 60 umpires. And uh, and they hired them to multi-year contracts. Well, when the case settled May 18th, uh, they brought us all back to work. They didn't release anybody. But now they had eight guys that they had to put on the field. So they had to give us all two weeks off. That's where we got the off time, the vacation time, they call it. And then later in the 80s, there was a a player's work stoppage. And so they consolidated the season. Well, that took away our off days, you know, like on a Thursday or a Monday. And so we went to federal court to get our off days, you know, to fight for our off days. And, uh, I'll never forget the federal judge was a little a lady named Shapiro. And every witness that went on the stand, they would, like Eric Gregg would say, I'm a National League umpire, and I'm one of the top five umpires in baseball. And the next guy would be Al Clark, and he'd say, yeah, I'm, I'm an American League umpire. I'm one of the top five umpires. And so after she heard all this testimony from these umpires, she said, now that I've heard from 25 of the top five major umpires, <laughs> she said, I'm going to take a a recess here. And when I come back, I'm going to give my summary judgment. Now, when she said that, both sides got nervous because she's going to make the ruling right then. She was tired of hearing it, you know, <laughs> and they got together and they gave us two more weeks. Of it. We've never negotiated for time off. They've given us four weeks off during the season. I, and I told them one time, I said, you know what? We should negotiate that for that. They might give us half the year off. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's, I mean, you talk about a grind. I mean, that's, that, that's got to be brutal. Well, Obviously, now, you see the world, you know. Yeah, but it's now set up where you work seven weeks and then you have a week off. That's how it is. And that's then you can make it. The, hard, the hardest part of the job is, is like you said, the travel. You know, it's uh, I can remember sometimes in September, I'd wake up and look at the phone to see what area code I was in so I'd know where I was. <laughs> hey, I don't know if you remember, when we were playing down in – Tampa, I don't remember what year it was. It was at the end of the year. It was hurricane season. Yeah. And the hurricane was about to hit. You, your, your umpiring crew was there. And uh, just we, I think we started the game earlier in that day, and you guys hopped on the plane with our charter, and we flew somewhere and dropped you off or something like that. Yeah. Do, do, you remember, do you remember that? I remember that, yeah. I thought, I thought dang, man, we're, we're sitting – we're sleeping with the enemy, man, on this break. <laughs> <plane, right? laughs> but see, see, that's the attitude that most of America and most – most of all baseball fans take is that uh, uh, we're the enemy. We're not. We're not the enemy. You know, I can't no. remember. We're we're all part of the family. Sometimes we have arguments, but we're all part of the family. And I think, I think the greatest thing about this sport is is that everybody has a little piece of what they have to do. It's like a big city. You know, it's uh, from from the bat boy to the ball boy to the usher, to the ticket taker, to the announcers, to the umpires, to the player. We're all, we're all part of a family. And, and it's an entertainment business. 
Yes. And your job is to get the game. Our job is to get the game played and get it played fairly. And that's, that's the most important thing. And, and I think uh, uh, sometimes you relate what the umpire does is like the policeman that pulled you over for making an illegal turn or he, you ran a stop sign at a policeman. And you go, well, why is he pulling me over? Well, he's just doing his job, you know, and sometimes you, you can't, you can't get around that. And that I've, I've heard this statement made about myself and other umpires. Like, well, you're controversial. No, I'm not controversial. I'm either right or I'm wrong. I'm not controversial. <laughs> it has nothing to do with it. In fact, I remember one day Joe Girardi, I kicked him out of the dugout for saying something about balls and strikes. And he jumped over the fence. He ran out and he says, you just did that so everybody know you here. I said, no, I, I've been here about 35 years. I think they knew it when I walked out here. So, <laughs> but, Hey, how, I mean, did, how did you guys get along with each other? I mean, uh, John was a little bit fiery. He, uh, you know, John got ejected a lot of games. But how was – you did, John. You got ejected in a few games uh, when you were managing, didn't you? Uh, well, when your team, when your team's that bad, man, you get you get tired of watching it sometimes. You know? Yeah, but I mean, you guys, you know, how did you two get along during the season, and and what do you recall was kind of the biggest beef you had with each other? I only, well, kicked, I only kicked John out of one game, and that was arguing about uh, a throwing incident. And yeah, it, then it was the automatic. You know, he got kicked out of five games for arguing with replay. Now, now think about that. When we when we put in replay, we thought the arguments would go away. We actually thought the arguments would go away. <laughs> our, hey. our, ejection, our ejection totals went up 30% the first year we put in replay because the managers would come out and argue with the replay, and you couldn't argue with the replay. It took them about three years to figure that out. <laughs> hey, well, let, hey, let, let me uh, let me give my side of the story, right? This, this is what got me every time, Joe, right? I'd go out there, you know – you know, they play it on the uh, the big screen up there, and I'm looking whether it's going to be overturned or whatever it might be, and I'm going, they have to overturn this, or they can't overturn this. Look, it's dead obvious, man. I'm looking at the same thing there, and they're looking – in New York, they're seeing all these, you know, all the different angles and everything. So what got me is if, let's say, they something that went against us, and I thought, there's no way. I'm looking at that screen. There's no way that cannot be ruled in our favor. So they, they leave it or whatever they do. And my argument was always – I, I always ask, who the heck's up? Who, what crew is up there in New York doing all this? <laughs> and no, nobody would ever say that. I say, well, you know, here's okay. Then if you can, I can tell me who's up there. Tell me who on this crew right here you're trying to protect, because there's no way in hell that uh, <laughs> this shouldn't be overturned or something. I said, I'd look around and go, must be CB. Are they trying to protect CB again? Uh, or don't, don't, be pick, don't be picking on CB. We had, we had an umpire one time. He was the, back then. The crew chief would go look at the the video with. Uh, the umpire that made the call. And if the crew chief was the one that made the call, then the two men would go with him. And we had an umpire go over one time and he's on the earphones with the, with the office. And he saw the replay on the board. And he said, you boys better change this or we're going to get killed. <laughs> so there's a, there's a lot of things that go on, you know, in replay. The big thing about replay is they don't show you in baseball what they're showing the replay official. In football, what the replay official sees is what's on that screen in the stadium. In baseball, they don't do that. In fact, sometimes what's the difference. What are they doing? Looking at different angles, uh, Joe. Yes. I mean, yes, they're not 12, showing the public. There's 12 designated cameras set up in each ballpark, and of the 12 cameras, everybody on both both teams get to see it. But if there's a feed from, say, the Yes Network or from the Toronto Network or from whoever, if it's aired, then the replay officials can get it. But the stadium cannot. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when replay first started, our best replays came from the Yes Network because they, the, the Yankees had more cameras than anybody else. And it took them about a year and a half to figure out, well, some of these replays we're re-showing – or hurting us because they showed that the umpire got it right or got it wrong or whatever, and it would go against the Yankees. So they quit giving the replays to the, uh, to the networks. But it took them two years to figure that out. <laughs> oh, God. Hey, you know what they ought to do, Joe, with that, that – you know, I, I think where they run into problems is when they give each team – all right, the guy said, hold on a minute, we want to check it, right? And they go up to the, the guy watching in, in the clubhouse. 
before they decide whether they want to review it or not. It ought to be just like it used to be the manager's eyes versus the umpire's eyes, right? If you think, if you think I missed it from sitting in the dugout that far away, replay it instantly, right? Don't, you you shouldn't have be able to call up there and let somebody look at and then do it. I think that's unfair. And they talk about trying to speed up the game for crying out loud. If I think you missed a call and I'm sitting over there, then, Hey, Joe, review it. I think you missed it. Right. Then it's kind of fair the way it is, you know, but, for some reason, we well, we try to. Yeah, but they they've reduced the time that you have to look at the replay too. It's it's gone down considerably. And, and yeah, but why why should yeah. you even be able to do that? It's it's because it's my eyes against your eyes or something. You're right? Isn't that the kind of the way it should be? Yeah, but don't you don't you want to get the play right? That's the umpire's first priority is to try to get every play right. And I you know I had to I had to fight with the umpire's union to put replay in because I said, you don't want to be the guy on ESPN or the late news saying that X umpire cost the Toronto Blue Jays or X umpire cost the Baltimore Orioles the ball game because of a call that he missed. And some of these calls, I mean, there's three ways you can miss a play. Lack of positioning, lack of timing, lack of concentration. There's only three ways you can miss it. Now, when you say lack of positioning, the players can sometimes take you out of position. So there'll be times that that replay is a helper. And I had the hardest time explaining to all the umpires, you know, that replay official is your fifth umpire. He's there to help you. He's not there to hurt you. And uh, I I get all that. I'm just saying, I'm not saying there should not be any uh, instant replay. I think, I just think they've got to eliminate, like say in Toronto Blue Jays, I think you missed a call at first base. Say, hey, hold on a minute. Let me call up into our clubhouse, let him look at it first to see whether we want to challenge it. You got to eliminate that. And if I think you missed it, I ought to say replay it. And it's, it'd be like the old, old time baseball where my judgment against yours. Right. So John, you, know, you want to take out that middleman. You just want to yeah. say manager's decision. Boom. We don't need to call into a guy in a clubhouse watching yeah. it. It's my, see, think- it's my uh, difference with the umpire. And I think the call is wrong. Challenge it. Yeah, I think that'd be more be more fair to the umpires, you know, and it would speed up the game for crying loud. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to well, rush. The- yeah, but then see, you're not wearing any glasses, you know. <laughs> Dick Williams used to wear glasses sitting on the bench, you know, <laughs> and when he'd get up to come out to argue, he'd take his glasses off. And he got really mad at me one day. I said, "You need to go put those glasses back on." <laughs> it's just a cookie, you think? How much of a difference could it make? Well, 100% of proceeds go to a local charity or community group. If we all buy a smile cookie, that's helped for countless Canadians. Buy a smile cookie. Make a difference. Hey, Joe, tell us some about your battles, man. You were in the National League, so you, you didn't have Earl Weaver, Billy Martin, but you had you would have Dick Williams, Lasorda, uh, you know, some of those those guys, you know, uh, I mean, you would have Boa, probably a young Bo when he took over. Oh, um, gosh. Yeah, I mean, who who are you? Who do you, Bobby Cox at the top of the list? Bobby I mean, Cox got kicked out more than Earl Weaver. Did you know that? Is that right? He got kicked out more than Earl Weaver. In fact, I was at a spring training game that the Orioles were playing, and I said, "You know, Earl, Earl's in the the restaurant there behind, uh, underneath the stadium, the stadium club or whatever it was." I said, "You know, Earl, if Bobby Cox gets kicked out three more times, he's going to pass you." And he got in an argument with me. Here we are. <laughs> he said, Man, there ain't no way anybody could have been. But Earl Weaver, I had him in two spring training games, and he never finished either one. Oh, kicked, spring training? Yeah, I kicked him out of both. The, the one, the first time I kicked him out, he yelled out, you'll never see the big leagues making calls like that. I said, I've been here four years. I threw him out. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and I had Billy, I had Billy Martin at one exhibition game, and I didn't see him. He's he never left the dugout. Uh, but Was Dick he even was, in the dugout? Billy might have been. He might have missed the game. He might have been upstairs. Yeah, he might have been somewhere else. But uh, Dick Williams was tough, but but Dick Dick was sharp. And one day, he told us in uh, I think it was in St. Louis. He said, "I don't give a damn what you call out there. If it goes against me, I'm coming out there." Well, sure enough, about the fourth inning, his third baseman, Salazar, got the guy in the rundown and didn't get out of the baseline. And the runner just turned around and ran right into him. So I said, obstruction, you third base, and well, here come Dick. Before he could get to the dirt, I said, 
you said you were coming out here. Even if we got it, got it right, doesn't matter. If it goes against you, you were coming. Then he called me every name in the book. <laughs> That was, a, that was one of the better Donnie Brooks between me and Dick Williams. One day when he was managing Montreal, he said, uh, your partners can't hide you out here. I said, no, but I'm going to hide you right now. <laughs> but some of the things they say are, are good, you know what I mean? Hey, I can... Joe, that's what the game's missing characters of the game, you know, whether it's umpires or even even managers, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, Lou Pinella on the oh. I, uh, I had him in Cincinnati one time. And uh, he hadn't got anybody up in the bullpen. And it's about the fifth inning. And they hit three rockets off this guy. And they caught two of them. So now they're out of the inning. And now they're still now just shuffling in the bullpen. Four pitches later, the side's out. I mean, three up, three down, four pitches. So they got to send the same guy out to the man, right? And uh, so the first guy hits a double. The second guy hits a ball off the left field wall. There's a play at second base, but, I mean, he, he's safe from me to you. And you're in Texas and I'm in Florida, right? So Lou comes charging out of the dugout. And, I mean, he's, everybody's wondering what he's doing out there. And I started screaming at him. Before he got there, I said, "If you'd got the guy up in the bullpen when you should have, oh. you wouldn't be out here trying to slow down the game." I get back. Oh. <laughs> so he started laughing. He says, "What did you start managing?" I said, "Well, I did more today than you've done already." <laughs> he went back to the dugout. <laughs> so it was two years later, and there was a play at second base in Houston, and he came out and he said. Uh, you know, I think you were out of position. I said, when did you start umpiring? <laughs> the same time you did in Cincinnati last year. <laughs> so, but he was uh, quite the character himself. Hey, that's a good old days, huh? Well, there's a there's a video on, uh, I think it's on YouTube, of Jerry Crawford and Don Zimmer. And I've gotten all kinds of text messages from people because the argument goes on for about three minutes and J Jerry and Don are yelling at each other back and forth, and I go in and separate them. And most of the texts say, Joe West, the peacemaker, what is this about? <laughs> <laughs> but that was back when, you know, when I was working with Harvey and, and Pulley and those guys. And they, they were – and when you work with those kind of guys, you pick up something from them all the time. And that's that's the good thing about uh, – that's another good thing about our replay system. Every umpire has to go into replay. And so you, you'll be watching all the games, except not just yours, but you'll be watching the other one. And when there's a tough play on the, on the board, every umpire in that room goes to look at it to see if the umpire's in position, to see if he waited long enough to call it, and, and this, that, and the other, you know. And so they learn from that. That's like an on-the-job training thing. So I think replay has been very successful for the umpires, and, and it's improved the you know, especially the younger umpires because they get to see and experience what the other guys are doing. Oh yeah, but hey, are they? Uh, let me ask you a question though, because you know, as a as a baseball manager, your managers get fired, right? The players get released, sent trade, whatever it might be. It seemed like every every year we come up with the same damn group of umpires, right? And there was and don't you can't you ain't gonna you can't gonna tell me some guys got there a little bit quick. It's like a, you rush a young player to the big leagues. And it could be, you know, it could be a good thing or it could, or it could be disastrous. A lot of these young umpires get to the, get, I think, get to the uh, big leagues quick. And, and, and they're, they're still learning. But there's like, there's like, uh, it's like everything's confrontational, right? It's, they, they think, do they teach them in the minor leagues? or, or so, Hey, listen, you take no crap from these guys. And I understand you need to do that sometimes. But it's like, there's like no personalities. Like you talk about those stories with Pinella and those guys in, in the, there's some give and take in, the, in the, the beauty of the game. Now it's like everybody's, you know, you know what I mean? Well, you know, I, I'll give you a good example. There was a thing in spring training this year where the, the umpire was having a confrontation with the pitcher. And, uh, and it was over the time clock. That's what it was about. And I, it, I'll tell you, it was, uh, it was Philadelphia because the catcher was real muto. And the umpire had been throwing the ball back 
to the pitcher when they would change the ball. So this time in the middle of the argument, Rio Muto reaches his glove back for the ball, and the umpire goes to put it in his glove, and Rio Muto's thinking, well, he's going to throw the ball back. So he moves the glove. Well, now the ball goes on the ground. <laughs> well, now this is the young umpire. So he jerked Rio Muto out of the game immediately, which in the situation that was happening, he was right for doing it that way. Had he had an experience, he could have said, did you do that for me? And Rio Muto would says, no, no. And he'd have gone and picked up the ball. You see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. But because yeah. he didn't have the experience and it made him mad at the time he did it and it showed him up at the time he did it. That's why Rio Muto got kicked out. Now, that umpire has been briefed and told there's another way to do it. But the problem is they come up here and they don't have that experience. And it's yep. – it's, it's the same with a ball player, you know. I mean, uh, they come up and they don't have the experience. That I can remember my first year in the big leagues, I was working with John Kipper. And he walked over and he says, uh, we're in Atlanta. And he said, did you kick out 50 guys in the minor leagues last year? And I said, no. I didn't kicked out 50 guys in my career. He said, well, the Braves think you have. Don't tell them what you did. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect, man. But see, there, there was like a lot of some give and take. Hey, I got a quick sto uh, story for you, too. Another about in my, my limited time behind the plate. Bruce Fremings got the plate, right? And in, in, uh, this, this would have been 80, 84. And Davey Johnson just taken over. He was the manager of the Mets. And uh, uh, I don't remember who was pitching. But anyway, there's some, there's some close calls, man. I mean, uh, it might have been Ronnie Darling was pitching. But, I mean, he's, he's hitting that corner pretty – if he's if he's missing, he's not missing by much, right? And so Davey Johnson and Mel Stottlemyre, his pitching coach over there, they're, they're like, hey, where is that? Where is that? Right? So I would, uh, so I'm a I'm a rookie catcher, right? I'm so I hear them, and so I ask Fremy. I didn't turn around. I say, Bruce, where is that? Uh, where is that pitch? He didn't say nothing. Right? So I go in. I went in. I went into the dug dugout after the inning was over, and they in uh, Davey and uh, Stottlemyre go, hey, where are those pitches? I go, I don't know. I, I'm they're I think they're strikes, but he's, I'm asking him. He's not saying a word, right? And they say, well, okay, well, stay on him, all right? Like, all right okay, right. Whatever. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Coach, yes, sir. So we go you're back gonna, out there. You're going to you're gonna stay on Bruce Remy. Okay, this will be yeah. good. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, I go back out there the next next inning in a couple borderline pitches, and I said, Bruce, man, gosh, that's a pretty good pitch. Finally, he said, timeout, right? He goes, I'm, I'm sitting in my squat behind the plate. He goes over, and leans over, and he's he gets out his little brush and he's brushing off the plate. This is the middle of the inning, right? And he looks at, raises, he looked at me, and he, he said, "He said, I tell you what, son, I'm calling this freaking game." And I said, "Yes, sir, Mister Fremen, you won't hear another word out of me, man." <laughs> <laughs> but hey, it, it got uh, it got it got his point across, and you got to do that sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and and you know what? Uh, that's that's another thing. Uh, that the umpire supervisors are scared to death when somebody calls the office about one of these young umpires. And uh, we had a situation in Tampa. And uh, the umpire did just that. He he came out and he swept off home plate and he chewed the catcher out. And, and uh, we go in the locker room and the supervisor comes in and says, uh, you know, the office would rather you do that from behind him. And I said, let, let me get something straight. This is the New York Yankees. If he goes around in front of the home plate and chooses this catcher out, everybody in baseball sees this. I think he did it the right way this time. I said, I don't think you should stand behind him and be like a sissy and just take it like that. I said, sometimes you have to stand up for what you're doing. And, you know, there'll be times when you have a complaint about a pitch and you say something about it. What, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. You know, right. I can remember – Many times, I think the best compliment an umpire can get is when the losing pitcher who loses two to one walks off the mound and says, thanks, good job. The winning pitcher, that's no big deal, you know, because he won. But when the losing pitcher comes off the mound and thanks you for trying to do a good job, that's the biggest compliment any player can give you. So, uh, and there, there's a lot to this that uh, – 
uh, umpires have been the villains for all these years. And uh, I don't think they're villains. I think they're just human beings trying to do the be very best they can. And like you said, uh, communication with the players and the, and the managers is a big, important part of it. I think that's one of the major parts of the umpire's job. And, um, and I've had coaches tell me, uh, you know, uh, sometimes that's the way they were brought up. And we'll yeah. have a talk with them. There's a first base coach for the White Sox that told a player I was going to kick him out of the game. He says, he said, uh, when this argument's over about this beanball situation, Joe West is going to come over here and he's going to throw you out of the game. And you are not to say a word. You're going to run right into the dugout. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened, you know. So Okay. Uh, but a lot of it, you know, a lot of it's like experience. The toughest part about being a new umpire is they pick on you until they see what you'll take. Chuck, yes. Tanner, Chuck Tanner was the very worst at that. He would pound the young umpires until you kick them out, until he knew where you were. And uh, Chuck Tanner's the nicest guy that ever put on the uniform. Ah, uh, okay. Interesting. He would, see, he would see how far he could go with each each young kid that came up. Yeah. And, and I can remember I was in my first or second year of spring training with the National League, and Al Barlick was my supervisor. Now Barlick's a Hall of Fame umpire. And I kicked Chuck Tanner out of a spring training game. The same thing. He was seeing how far he could go. And the last thing he said to me, because there in Bradenton, the screen is right up next to the umpire and the catcher. And uh, the last thing he said to me was uh, the same thing like Weaver said. So you'll never see the big leagues. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, there's a guy with his fingers through the screen. And I look up as Al Borlick. He said, that kid will be here when you die. He's screaming and Chuck Tanner from the stands. <laughs> and, and I, I mean, I loved Al Barlick. I, I liked Chuck Tanner. <laughs> but, I mean, and and I was there when Chuck passed. So. <laughs> but uh, those are, I mean, those actually have, you can't even make this stuff up, you know. No. Yeah, those were, that was the, the good old days, you know. Uh, but, yeah, you guys are, you guys are viewed it. It's like the police now, you know, but be careful. We might try to defund you if we're not careful, you know. Well, oh, they don't yeah. they don't pay them enough anyway. <laughs> hey, hey, Joe, did you uh, – was there any guys that got your, you know, your fuse a little bit shorter where it didn't take that much to, to light it up? I mean, was there any guys that you, like, you're expecting? Well, I think – I think fuse? I'm going to tell you, I didn't have a very long fuse with any of them. <laughs> but one of the funny ones was uh, A.J. Brzezinski. We're in, spring oh. We're in spring training, and he doesn't want to be there. And the Yankees are beating the Braves like six to one. And he's gotten to catch these guys that come in because the only reason they hired him was to work with the young pitchers that they had. And uh, the Yankees are beating them pretty bad, and he don't want to be there. So the pitch comes in, and uh, and it's low, and I called it a ball. He said, I got to have that pitch. I said, the ball's low. And he said, I don't care. I got to have that pitch. I said, let me get this straight. We're supposed to change the scope of the game <laughs> because you got to have that pitch. He said, well, you're screwing him up. He's trying to get kicked out, right? Uh, okay. Yeah. Finally, he says enough to get kicked out. So I looked over at Freddie and I said, hey, Freddie, we're going to need a new catcher. This was not playing nice in the sandbox. <laughs> <laughs> Freddie pointed to a guy on the bench. The guy ran up. That was it. <laughs> Oh gosh, you're right. You know, uh, you can't make that's the good old days, man. You can't make that stuff up. That's stuff people aren't even. They have no ideas going on. You know. Well, one it, of the it, one of the better ones was we we used to pull this off. We get some people that are going to go to the game. We know they're going to go to the game the next day, and uh, so we'll tell them. <clears throat> and this this really happened with uh, in San Francisco. I can remember this specifically because Harvey was the home plate umpire. And he wasn't with us the night before. And it's me, Pulley, Eric Gregg, and Harvey. And we the, the the TV people from the Dodgers are in the bar where we are. Said, you guys don't get enough exposure. We you guys gotta do something where we can show you the you know the television audience that you're there. So I looked at Pulley and I said, Okay, in the bottom of the seventh inning, barring a triple play. 
we will stop the game for no apparent reason. We will just stop the game for no apparent reason, right? So the the TV people go, really? And Frank said, yep, we're going to do it. Right? So sure enough, <clears throat> we go work the game. In the seventh, and it's been cloudy all day. So what my plan was, was to say there's a glare over the first base dugout. And sure enough, in the seventh inning, clouds broke. They hit a ground ball, the first hitter in the bottom of the seventh. I walk right over the mound. I'm pointing over the dugout at first base. Frank comes in from first base, and he's pointing over the dugout. Eric comes in from second. He's pointing over the dugout. And uh, so the game stops. Doug Harvey walks out. He meanders out from home plate. He says, what's going on, kid? And I said, well, there's a glare over the dugout so that the players can hear us, you know. He said, well, the sun just came out. That's probably a glare on somebody's watch. Don't worry about it. Everything will be all right. And he turns around and goes back to home plate. <laughs> so we all go back to our positions. And sure enough, the inning ends, and Eric yells over from second base. Look at the center field cameraman. And this guy behind the camera center field has got his thumb up. He's pointing like this. Is he? That's great. <laughs> So, so we did that about three, four times. And then years later, we're in Dodger Stadium. No, we're in San Diego because the Dodgers are playing San Diego. The guy pitching for him is Greg Maddox. And we had told this golf pro, because he was going to be sitting in the skybox, we're going to stop the game for no apparent. Same thing. <laughs> so we get to the seventh inning. And Greg Maddox has a no-hitter. <laughs> <laughs> so, sure enough, we stopped the game after he got the first out and walked over to the mound, point behind the, 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 the Dodger dugout. And, and uh, Maddox says, what's going on? He says, well, there's a laser out here. It's like a, a scope on a rifle. <laughs> Maddox, Maddox says, What's it pointed at? And they said, you. <laughs> Greg, Greg ran around and hid behind me. <laughs> no. Like naked gun, man. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh, that's that's beautiful. And and he got three more outs, and then they got a hit in the night. But anyway, it was funny. Hey, did you ever, did you ever uh, call a no-hitter, perfect game or anything back there? I had one no-hitter behind me. Played, it was Clay Buckholz's no hitter. I think it was his okay. second big leagues. I had about ten or eleven on the bases. I, in fact, I think I had. A, you had Ryan, didn't you? Ryan, the I, fifth I had uh, no Ryan, hitter. Ryan's fifth no hitter at first base. Yeah, and that was an ugly no hitter. He must have walked a dozen, but they couldn't hit him. I mean, he was wild enough that they. That was the year the Dodgers went to the World Series. I think it was eighty one. Eighty yeah. one. Yeah, I think. I think they won the World Series that year. But Ryan no hitter, that was his fifth no hitter. Joe, I want to get your memories of Montreal. Well, yeah, I was I was there when Montreal went to the, the playoffs the first time. Uh when they were uh I think it was it was eighty one. That was a tremendous ball club. I mean, uh the Carter was the catcher, I think, and they had uh Steve yeah. Rock. They had Andre Dawson. They had Cromarty. They had, I think, Valentine. Ellis Valentine. Ellis, yeah. Valentine was quite the player. I mean, he was I, – I was in uh, Montreal one day when he threw Daryl Evans out at first base on a single. <laughs> yeah. They said he had the best arm ever. Well, maybe not Clemente. Clement uh, well, Clemente would have to be very good to be better than him. Because uh, yeah. if you remember, there was an all-star game up there in, in Montreal – Dave Parker threw a guy out at home plate, tagging up. And Carter made a great play to tag him out to get him. And they said, what a great throw. And I said, yeah, if Ellis Valentine had been out there, they wouldn't have sent the runner. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Well, all right. Well, hey, I got – how about singing a tune for us, man? You, 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 ever, you know that – you know the words to <laughs> Oh Canada? You know this <laughs> – of course, I know the words to Canada. Well, how about singing? You want to be a knock? Well, you you if want I, to knock if, I do, if I do that, you have to stand up. <laughs> I, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> you want to do it? I'll sing yeah, a duet with you. 
You get you can sing the words. No, I'm gonna you, let you do it. You sing it. No, no, no. We have to do this in two part harmony. Right? Well, all right, all right, all right. Just don't drop any French on me, will you? Oh, Canada, Canada our, our home native, native land, land, true patriot love, love in, in all, all thy sons command. And with glowing, glowing heart, hearts, we, we see rise the true north, strong, strong and, free. and free. Oh, Canada, Canada, from far and far wide. What? We, we, we Oh gosh, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Finish it, John. Uh, uh, we we na, 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 na. God keep we stand our land. on guard for, for thee. thee. God keep yeah. our land. Glory on us and free. And free. Oh, get up. We stand, stand on, on guard. guard for thee. thee. Oh, Canada, Canada we stand, stand on guard for thee. <laughs> Gosh, hey, I'm going to get run out of town, man, because I could I, 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 I know that. Gosh, dog. well, I know that one better than I know the uh, our national anthem down here. So, <laughs> well, Joe, listen, man, it's been a pleasure, pal. You know, uh, pleasure. I appreciate you know, you, John having me on. This is a lot of fun. Well, you know what? You're always good to me. You all, you've been great for the game. You're, you're a legend in the game. You're one of the true characters. And uh, to accomplish what you did is incredible. Like I said, it's the Cal Ripken record of for umpires. That'll never be come close to that. Nobody, because no, no, nobody's tough enough to do that. And you've had an amazing career, whether it's you know from your collegiate days as a, as a high school, I mean, a college quarterback to umpire to the music business and. Uh, no, uh, we, we we sure appreciate you. You know, the game appreciates you. You know, you it's a thankless job as an umpire. We know that. But you know, people know how good you were and, and uh you've been great for the game. Well, you're very kind and I thank you. Thank you. And tell your daughter we're gonna do a duet. Tell her to practice. You're the reason God made Oklahoma. Oh, we'll do all right. That's a deal, dude. She sings better than I do. <laughs> take my... you Joe, take thanks, pal. All right. Thank you, Joe. Hit him straight. What a character, Joe West. Great gabbing with Gibby. I really enjoyed that, John. Yeah, you know, Joe's one of the all-time characters of the game, you know, and, and uh, yeah, he took a lot of heat. Umpires take heat, right? They're the bad guys. Somebody's always complaining. Nobody likes either side, you know. Um, but he's really, really a fascinating guy, what he's done in his career. And to think he can umpire that many games – Major League games. It's 5, incredible. 400. Yeah, yeah, why would you even want to, you know? But it's it's a tough it's a tough racket. It's 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 uh you know, these guys don't aren't, don't have it easy. And then they go out there, you know, they're they're running low on sleep because they don't travel quite as good as the big league players do on their on their team charters. And you go out there, you know, you get to get to the ballpark and or you fl your flight lands early in the afternoon, you gotta go to the ballpark. And that these guys grayed out pretty damn good, you know. Uh, so sometimes we're a little bit unfair to them, but you know. And in, in the, I think what's been lost in the game with a lot of the rule changes and the instant replay is the kind of the give and take between the managers and the umpires. And uh, uh, but that's the way it is. But but they're usually the bad guys. Yeah, it was it was great though to have a discussion with him and uh, Joe was just super. And uh, thank you for bringing uh, Joe on this week. That was good. I think people are going to love it. Uh, but now it's time, inspired by our friends at Miller Lite. John, it's that time of the week. It's time for Gibby's Roast and Toast. First, I got to ask you, who are you roasting this week? Well, I don't know if I'm roasting anybody in particular, but I, I'm, I guess we'll say this. You know, we look at, uh, we were talking about Tampa earlier in the year. You got off to the, you know, historic start, right? And then we, we just talked about the Blue Jays going, you know, this this tough road trip in the, uh, the American least, everybody's over 500. So the, the division you play in does matter. You know, it's made it a little bit easier, especially now you got wild card teams, right? But, but you know what? You you play in the, the American League East, it's a different animal than you play in the uh, American League Central. I, I was looking at that. There's one team in the American League Central over 500. The combined record is like 55 and 87. 
So, uh, you know, you put the Blue Jays, you put Tampa in one of those divisions. You know what? In the old, the old, you know, everybody, the Chicago White Sox have been talking the talk of baseball this, this past week on, on their losing streak and, you know, how, uh, you know, they thought the answer last year was Tony La Russa. They needed, they needed to get him out of there. And then, but no, it's, it's a little bit deeper than that. Maybe they need some different players, but the only, the only, the only team saving the Chicago White Sox from the seller is the Kansas City Royals, who are right. seven and twenty-two. So, and they fired one of the best general managers last year in Dayton Moore. Surprisingly, he's down there in Texas now, working with uh, Chris Young. And uh, there's, a, there's a reason they're playing so well. So yeah. sometimes, you know what? Hey, it, it you're fortunate when you play in uh, certain divisions. Uh, make, can make your life. Base, Major League Baseball is not easy, but some there's certain places it can make your life a little bit easier. That's true. Well, I mean, time to toast somebody, and I uh, would love to hear who you're toasting this week. We talked about it a little bit, but let us everybody know who the toast of the week is. Uh, hey, Johnny, we're going to tr- toast Drew Maggi from the Pittsburgh Pirates. You know, uh, it's one of those feel-good stories. You know, the, the we talk about Joe West umpiring, you know, for over 40 years. Here's Maggi spending all that time in the minor leagues and not giving up, right? He, he 13 years dream. in the minor leagues. He's 33 years old. He gets his his opportunity to play with a hot team, the Pirates, and uh, he gets to record his first major league hit at 33 years old. What a feel-good story that was. Yeah, and you, you know what? Uh, you tip your hat to the guy, you know, you don't, and you don't know how long it's going gonna, it's gonna to last, but – uh, good for him. But I remember my last year there in 2018, we did the same thing with John Birdie, right? John Birdie was a, a team favorite, a player favorite in the Blue Jays minor leagues. Was one of like the MVP type of all his all his teams, but he had concussion problems, four or five of them. He never got the call, right? He was one of those kind of the guys. Well, you know, he he's, he he never was on the map. And finally, you know, the coaches always wanted to bring him up, right? But there never was that opportunity. And then uh, in 2018, in the last week, last week, 10 days in September, even after ro- uh, rosters had expanded, some some reason we needed a player, right? So we uh, yeah. went to the front office. There was, they were a little bit reluctant, but we called up John Birdie, right? You know, uh, same kind of thing. Well, at least, you know what? If this, he could say he got to the big leagues, right? Because he, he, he earned that. He may never, he might not play another, another year after that. But, you know, he could say, you know what? I got to the big leagues. So and I, I think we brought him up. They, they, the front office, I think, thought that we were going to just, uh, you know, have him on a, a body in case we need. I said, heck no, man. I'm on my way out. He's going to play every stinking game, man. So oh, Big John goes in there. He gets off, man. He plays well. Next thing you know, he's been in uh, uh, the Florida Marlins ever since. He led the led the league in stolen bases last year. And in, in the uh, now Maggie, may, Maggie may not turn into that guy, but you know what? But it was kind of interesting. Uh, ben Sherrington, the general manager of Pittsburgh. And Derek Shelton, the manager, were both with us at 18. So they knew that. So maybe that factored into it. They thought, you know, this this is a, a can't lose situation. And tip your hat to the kid for getting a knock, you know. And uh, hopefully, hopefully he turns into another John Birdie. Wouldn't that be a you never know. Even, even better story. So well, salute great, the Pittsburgh Pirates. Yes, we do. Uh, great, great story. And congratulations to Drew. Uh, not getting one knock so far, but two, hitting three thirty three in just a few games. So that's you better quit now, man. While he's ahead, he's gonna be quit, he's gonna ahead. retire three three hundred hitter. Hey, you hit four fifty four with the eighty six Mets, didn't you? But you know what? You know what's sad about all this? Nobody cares about averages anymore with all the analytics. That's like the one OPS. You know, and once you tell Pete Rose that, you know, Pete. Uh, yeah, exactly. I'm never gonna understand that uh, new stat, and I'm on. You know. I'm an old school guy too, in my own way, John. Well, we're both and, old. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Corner booths, sticky floors, weekdays that feel like weekends. You never forget the way some things taste. Miller Lite, great taste, 90 calories. Tastes like Miller time. Well, that's going to about wrap up uh, this edition of the Gibby Show. Uh, don't forget to order a copy of Gibby's book, Gibby Tales of a Baseball Lifer by John Gibbons and Greg Oliver. And uh, that is available wherever you buy your books. And we'll be back next week to talk more baseball with you right here on the Gibby Show. For John Gibbons, I'm John Arezzi. Have a great week, everybody, and go Blue Jays. And make sure you get out there and get you a smile cookie, man, and help support the uh, 
your fellow fellow man. There you go. 